cabinet in about a half an hour for the third time in as many months. The shuffle will introduce a new president of the Treasury Board earlier this month. Of course, Jane Philpott resigned from that position, leading us to today. Welcome as well to our viewers joining us online at cbc.ca and on the CBC News YouTube page. We have got a lot of coverage and analysis over the next hour. Uh, we're going to begin, though, with the CBC's Janice McGregor, who's outside, as you can see there, Rideau Hall. That's where the cabinet shuffle is going to take place. Hey, Janice, nice to see you. We see, I can't really make out the faces, but someone's walking in there. Yeah, I, I, this is not our new minister. Um, some <laughs> officials arriving by taxi cab. We are keeping an eye on the driveway, as we always do here. Uh, third time's the charm, maybe, for Mr. Trudeau. Um, none of these cabinet shuffles, of course, this winter uh, were uh, things he wanted to do or planned to do. He's been forced into them by resignations. Five ministers shuffled in January, three ministers shuffled. Uh, last month, we expect maybe just one today, right, Vashi? So not a lot of cars expected to pull up behind me today. Possibly only one, possibly the one carrying uh, what we expect to be uh, Joyce Murray, uh, uh, perhaps to become the next uh, Treasury Board president here today. But uh, we're told a very short ceremony uh, behind me here in, in Rideau Hall, maybe only five minutes. That's a pretty dead, give dead giveaway that we're not looking at uh, moving a lot of people around here kind of feel like I have a bit of deja vu looking at you there. Uh, it feels like just, just a few weeks ago that you were in the same in the same spot. You mentioned sort of the with precursor. The same hat. With the same hat, <laughs> yep. Now legendary hat. It, with this with the same precursor, right? So so the, the 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 idea that this isn't the Prime Minister's choice, that there have been a lot of uh, you know controversial events that have led to this juncture. That's right, and he is not going to come out and take questions at the conclusion of this ceremony. Of course, you know, and I'm sure our viewers know that uh, when I, when it's a, a larger cabinet shuffle that is really a reframing uh, of a government, often the prime minister will want to come out and, and put his stamp on it, explain some of his choices, put some new messaging uh, to, to some of the new mandates he's given uh, his new ministers. That's not happening today. This is, you know, I think not a good news story uh, for Mr. Trudeau. It's something he has to do uh, because Carla Qualtro can't continue uh, carrying uh, double Double duty, uh, two portfolios indefinitely, especially, frankly, spring is a busy time at Treasury Board. They have a lot of spending estimates to get out. They have a lot of key relationships with public sector unions uh, to manage this spring. Um, they need a full-time Treasury Board president in place. And uh, so he has to do this sooner rather than later. Um, but, uh, you know, that's that's pretty much a given. And I, I don't think he, he necessarily is going to want that to be his key message today. So uh, we're expecting to hear from the new minister, uh, but uh, not from the prime minister himself. Same thing uh, as the last cabinet shuffle, right, where he didn't come out, but the ministers did. Janice, mm -hmm, that's right. Okay, we'll get yeah. you. You get to. Just, we'll get you if you don't mind to stay there. I apologize for how cold it is because we want you to take part in our Monday morning special edition of the Power Panel. Because I'm also joined <laughs> by uh, Marty Patrickin of iPolitics. He's in Montreal and joining us via Skype. In Toronto, Laura Stone of The Globe and Mail. And here with me in Ottawa, Chris Hall, host of CBC Radio's The House. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Nice Good to morning. see you. Uh, thank you very much for waking up bright and early to talk about this third cabinet shuffle. Chris, Chris, I'll start with you, fresh off a of flight. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, a, a couple of things. Uh, as Janice points out, this is not something the Prime Minister wanted to do. It was forced on him this time by the resignation of, uh, of Jane Philpott, which leads back to Jody Wilson-Raybould. And no matter how hard the government has tried, they really have been unable to put the issues that she's raised behind them. Uh, and this, I, hope, I, I think they're hoping, will be the last time that they have to deal with in anticipation of tomorrow's budget. Um, Joyce Murray is a name that we are hearing. It makes a lot of sense on a whole lot of levels. One is she's from Vancouver, so replacing Jody Wilson-Raybould with somebody from that city, which will be a key battleground in the fall election campaign. She has cabinet experience. She's been the parliamentary secretary to Treasury Board since 2015. Uh, so that makes some sense in terms of minimizing disruption, someone who's very familiar with it. Um, but I go back to the politics of this, and this is the, the, real, the real question that they, they will try to, uh, I'm sure, try to close today, is, is how do you now put in place the cabinet team that you're going to go into the next election campaign with? And as everyone's pointed out, Treasury Board may not be the highest profile, but it is the one that deals with transparency and accountability of how public money is spent. And for a government that spends a lot of money, you really can't leave the post vacant for much longer. Laura, let's talk about the void that they're trying to fill here, and that is of Jane Philpott. You wrote a really interesting piece uh, 
over the weekend, you spoke with a number of people uh, about her political future and the impact of her decision to leave cabinet. Obviously, we're seeing one of the impacts today. Uh, tell us a bit about the hole that's being filled here. Well, you know what, Jane Philpott is one of the most um, well-respected, well-liked uh, members of of. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's caucus. I mean, at the cabinet table, um, everyone just praised her. No one has a bad thing to say about J about Jane Philpott, and um, everyone says that she entered politics for the right reasons, right? I mean, she was she was a family doctor. She worked in Africa. Um, she's kind of later along in her career. Um, her riding association says that she was scouting campaign offices, that she does want to run again. But uh, those close to her, such as her sisters, her family members, um, say they honestly don't know what she'll. Do. It might be difficult for her after stepping down. She loved being in cabinet after stepping down from such high profile positions to run as a backbencher. So that's an interesting one to watch to see, you know, J uh, Jody Wilson Raybould has said that she does want to run again as a Liberal MP. Jane Philpott has not been as explicit. Uh, so um, her political future is a little more uncertain, I would say. As far as the politics, um, Marty, behind this, this cabinet pick, and we are expecting, as Janice mentioned, just a short five-minute ceremony, which indicates it will just probably be that, that one move. Uh, I was saying to Heather prior, uh, prior to the start of our show that remember back to Jerry Butts' testimony, the former principal secretary to the prime minister, and one of the most interesting parts of it, I guess, as a political junkie, was how he sort of pulled back the curtain on the way in which these decisions are made and the political calculus behind them. In this case, if it is Joyce Murray, we know that it is replacing uh, Jane Philpott. What do you think the political calculus is? Uh, what I, I mean, part of the thing just about the whole the whole sort of cabinet shuffle in general, I think is, uh, is again, you can't get away from the politics of this. There's a political footing here. Uh, they're going to sort of do with Joyce Murray what they would do in any situation going into an election and have, facing this massive, uh, well, it's called what it is, it's called a scandal. Uh, and then, sort of, what they want to do is sort of pivot away from the from the idea, try to get this out of out of uh, keep this in the Ottawa bubble, I guess, in a way. And uh, how do you do that? You go into a but you start you have a budget like we're gonna we're gonna have uh, we're gonna have today and tomorrow, and talk about the middle class a lot. Say the words middle class a lot. Uh, talk about pharmacare, dental care, uh, you know, relief for first time home home buyers, this kind of thing. Uh, try to try to keep everything that we're talking about, all this oxygen that we're expending right now. Keep this very, very much within two or three square kilometers of uh, of Parliament Hill, and uh, and, and basically uh, try to just uh, starve it of oxygen in the rest of the country. To recap for our viewers, we're anticipating the third cabinet shuffle in as many months right now. Uh, we've got a, a camera and Janice out, uh, outside of Rideau Hall waiting for that. We're anticipating just a small shuffle. Uh, we're, we're told by uh, the Prime Minister's office to expect only a five-minute uh, ceremony, I believe. Let me just go over the timeline a little bit before I bring Janice back in. January 14th, we saw the first cabinet shuffle prompted by uh, Scott Bryson, who was at the time president of the Treasury Board, his resignation. Uh, February 12th, Jody Wilson Raybould resigned from cabinet, which prompted a second cabinet shuffle on March 1st. Just a few days later, on March 4th, Jane Philpott, uh, who at the time was also president of the Treasury Board, uh, ended up uh, resigning. And then on March 18th, uh, which is today, we're, that brings us to today, to the third cabinet shuffle. And we are, we are anticipating, uh, word is, Janice, that it is Joyce Murray, uh, who will be taking over. Tell us a little bit about what you know about her. Yeah, a, a very experienced politician, right? Someone who uh, was a liberal, survived as a liberal uh, at, in some elections that didn't go well for the Liberal Party, frankly. Um, someone who had been in provincial politics previously, has uh, provincial cabinet experience, uh, and a long kind of history dealing with issues like climate change. I was reading up a little bit last night when she did her MBA, her thesis was about climate change several decades ago, so long before the rest of us were talking about it, uh, she was. Someone who, um, in the context of being a West Coast politician, had also been uh, very active on ocean protection issues, uh, something else that uh, matters, I think, to Liberal voters on the West Coast right now. Um, but but, uh, you know, someone who brings more than a decade of experience in a seat that I, assuming she runs again, I believe she is, um, should be fairly safe for the Liberals, which frees her up to do some bigger campaigning and also some bigger management for this government. They are going to have to manage some key stakeholders as 
they say, in public sector unions um, over the next few months if they don't want to be uh, meeting them in a confrontational uh, way during this election campaign. I'm assuming that would be a big part of the job that she would be taking on this spring, trying to uh, get that onto a better footing. Of course, with the Phoenix pay fiasco, uh, this has not been a great relationship for this Liberal government. Uh, she has a lot of work to do, I think, to uh, to repair that relationship uh, in the months ahead. Um, but, you know, someone who has uh, taken some bold positions in the past and managed to do it, though, in a way that didn't appear, uh, appear disloyal to her team and never burnt her bridges back to, uh, you know, the Prime Minister and, and other caucus members. Um, interesting uh, for them to have a cabinet minister minister who has that skill, who's known as someone who isn't necessarily always towing the line of the day, um, but uh, has managed to do so in a way uh, where her overall loyalty to the party uh, isn't, isn't uh, in question. Chris, let's talk about that loyalty. She wrote a letter to her, her constituents, Joyce Murray, uh, on March 5th, right after uh, Jane Philpott quit cabinet. And she said things like, Firstly, I have absolute confidence in the integrity of our Prime Minister, and I'm immensely grateful for the critical work he and the Liberal team are doing on a range of urgent challenges like climate action, and she goes on to list a few others. Having worked with Prime Minister Trudeau since we were in opposition in 2008, then having contested the Liberal leadership race with him in 2012, 2013, which she came in second in, right. uh, and working with him during his first government, I know him as a collaborative and principled person. Yeah, a, a, a really strong sort of defense of the positions that uh, the Prime Minister has taken in response to Jody Wilson Raybould's suggestions, uh, allegations that she had uh, suffered a, a series of efforts to try to get her to intervene in the SNC Lavalin case. Uh, Joyce Murray. I think following up on what many people have said inside the caucus, Carla Qualtrill being another, that they didn't perceive this, diversity of views is important, and that all throughout this process, uh, as Jody Wilson-Raybould herself has said, there was nothing illegal and the decision finally was left to her. But I would point out, as Janice was mentioning, um, Joyce Murray came out against the mm -hmm. TMX, the purchase of the Trans Mountain Pipeline, uh, just as we watch a car pulling up here. Uh, but she did so in a way that wasn't challenging the authority of the Prime Minister, but simply saying, I am representing my constituents on this really important issue. Uh, I'm concerned about taxpayers' money being used to buy this, but it didn't, in, in, in that sense, uh, lead to any kind of confrontation with the Prime Minister. So she's very, very strong on representing her constituents, on speaking to those issues that she cares about, uh, but doing so as a team player, saying, I accepted the decision of Cabinet to go ahead with the purchase of TMX. I still believe it's consistent with our efforts to try to reduce greenhouse gas emissions because it brings Alberta on board, and that's the largest emissions producing province. Okay, I want to remind our viewers who are joining us online, if you're watching us on YouTube or Twitter or Facebook, you can send us your questions and we'll try to get to them throughout the hour. We are, of course, awaiting uh, the third cabinet shuffle uh, by the Trudeau government in as many months. We're anticipating just one minister, of course, that's to replace Jane Philpott, who resigned from Trudeau's cabinet as president of the Treasury Board back on March 4th. Uh, Laura, we have one question already. Jessica Ko Kowaleski asks on Facebook, Interesting that he shuffles again. How are those people supposed to familiarize themselves with the area issues of their responsibility? I wonder if just anyone can kind of pick up those responsibilities. In interesting question in light of sort of how many shifts we've seen, particularly in this portfolio. Absolutely. I mean, and if it does end up being Joyce Murray, that kind of makes the most sense, seeing as she's been the parliamentary secretary for mm -hmm. um, coming up to four years. She's been in that post um, helping out the minister, uh, essentially, you know, Scott Bryce and Jane Philpott, and now she could become the minister herself. And she also sits on the cabinet committee. So she would be well versed in the issues. Uh, so I think that could be a plus for Joyce Murray taking on the role. You know, to Chris's point, I, I, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about this doing politics differently with, with um, Jane Philpott and Jody Wilson-Raybould. This is more doing politics traditionally, um, you know, it. bringing in exactly. someone from uh, someone like Joyce Murray who has cabinet experience. Uh, in the province who could be construed as a team player. You know, she didn't get a, t a cabinet post after she ran for the leadership, coming second to Justin Trudeau by a wide margin. Um, but still, you know, someone who's kind of bided her time and waited. Um, and this, and, and to me, that's the sign of this cabinet shuffle, if indeed it is Joyce Murray. Yeah, Marty, that's a really interesting yeah. point. Just this idea, and we've been talking a lot about the sort of maybe unintended consequences of quote unquote doing politics differently. And we're looking there to see who gets out of that car, of course. Uh, but but talk about a bit about Joyce Murray and how this might be a more traditional choice. Well, Chris Chris nailed it there with the with the TMX purchase. Uh, someone who can express your position without having you know spleen venting and and uh, really getting Justin Trudeau <laughs> I don't want to say angry but sort of causing exactly what happened with Jody Wilson-Raybould. 
uh, and uh, Ms. Philpott. The, I think what you have to realize now is that everybody that's in the cabinet is very, very well aware of the f of how much the government has suffered from this particular scandal. And I think what you're going to see is a certain battening down of the hatches. It's really, really nice to say that we're going to do politics differently and all that kind of stuff. But to paraphrase someone in the PMO during the Jody wilson stuff uh, uh, scandal, you know, you can say that all you'd like. It's not going to be worth anything if you uh, if we don't get reelected. Uh Let's let's say this for the Liberals a third time a charm uh, and make sure that everybody stays on board and doesn't uh, create sort of the, the, the sense of dissent that you've had within the prime minister's uh, inner circle over the last couple of months or a month and, and a half. And there she is uh, exiting a car right now. So it looks like it pretty much is Joyce Murray, Chris. Yeah, yeah I, I don't think. All right. We were right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. Called it. It really shouldn't be a surprise. Uh, we, we've already walked through the, the skills that she has and the, the fact that she's a team player. I, I would also note that, uh, as I think Laura first mentioned, um, she did survive through 2008 and 2011. She won her Vancouver Quadra riding rather narrowly in 2015 by a more comfortable margin. Uh, I want to go to the politics of this, though. This will be an important cabinet position in Vancouver, in the lower mainland area, right. which will be important to the Liberals' fortunes in getting reelected. We know Trans Mount remains a big issue. We know where she stands in this and why she has and how she has eloquently stated why she felt she had to support the cabinet uh, but also with this whole issue around is the west being heard properly what about the future of uh, uh, of the province when someone like Jody Wilson Raybould is no longer inside cabinet so politically this makes a whole lot of sense for the government as well there's a, the continuity and the position but the politics is not you really can't avoid that either Janice I want to head back to you Janice is outside of, of Rideau Hall where we just saw Joyce Murray emerge from a car confirming what we had expected that she will be the one to replace, or apparent looks like confirming, she will be the one to replace Jane Philpott, who resigned from her position as president of the Treasury Board back on March 4th. We also saw a Michael Warnick, clerk of the Privy Council, who's become a sort of central figure in, in this entire controversy, Janice, emerge as well a few minutes before Miss Murray. That's right. Neither one of them uh, had any uh, words for us uh, today, just uh, went straight inside, um, not giving us uh, kind of any exciting tidbits there to report, I'm afraid. But uh, yeah, Ms. Murray, you know, she, she has been described as, as a bit of a, an introvert. Um, and I think we saw a little bit of that personality uh, heading inside. There are people who have wondered uh, why she did not get the call to come to Rideau Hall sooner, quite frankly. Uh, someone who uh, a lot of us, I think, thought would have been in the cabinet right from the start of this government. Um, you know, perhaps better late than never. We see her uh, out, of, out of the car and, and into Rideau Hall today. Um, kind of interesting, one of the thoughts I had on the drive over here, you know, uh, to see the, well, the Prime Minister elevate his left. parliamentary uh, secretary uh, to Treasury uh, Board uh, up to uh, be uh, the president of the Treasury Board today. You know, that was the uh, position that Scott Bryson vacated. Just imagine if he had made this move back in January. Uh, would we have had everything that has unfolded in the last couple of months? Would we have been through all this, uh, you know, um, in Canadian politics? Um, the mind boggles, but woulda, coulda, shoulda. Uh, it appears that she will be the Treasury Board president now. And Laura, a couple interesting quotes from uh, some pieces that have been written about her that I want to highlight to you and get your take on. First, on on that idea that that Janet flag, Janice, I'm sorry, flagged about whether uh, she had a, she should have been in cabinet earlier, basically based on her experience. She was a provincial cabinet minister, environment minister under uh, Gordon, former BC Premier Gordon Campbell. She said, uh, I believe this is, I think this is from the TIE. I had no political experience either before being a, appointed as a cabinet minister provincially. Despite that, I knew I was able to contribute. So that's why when our prime minister appointed people with no prior political experience, one of my responses was, okay, I get it, that worked for me. So again, an example of what I think others on the panel have been highlighting, that she's able to sort of uh, rectify uh, perhaps some incongruencies and questions around uh, around loyalty, around that kind of thing, and and still remain uh, sort of an active member of the, of the Liberal caucus and one that appears to be pretty loyal. Yeah, I mean, I think she's seen as a team player there. I mean, I, th I think what we've seen covering politics with cabinet shuffles, they don't always make sense. Um, you know, there are political calculations there. The best for person for the job might not get the role because of, you know, geography or in, sometimes with the with gender parity or other issues, political, there are political calculations behind this. So, um, you know, they had their reasons for not um, appointing Joyce Murray initially, but she's kind of, you know, been brewing on the sidelines, um, you know, for years. She's kind of just been waiting. And uh, th this is her moment, it seems. She's the right person 
at this time for this role. And the, the government clearly does not want to overcomplicate this by um, by changing any other ministerial Got roles. the Prime Minister arriving there, I believe, as well. Sorry to interrupt you, Laura. Oh, no problem. Before the election. <laughs> Want to come over and answer some of our questions? Nope. I hear Katie. I hear, I hear our <laughs> colleague Katie good. Simpson asking uh, about having another, thir I think, a third cabinet shuffle before the election, and as well um, about if he'll come over and answer any questions. And his answer was something like having a good day. Yeah. But, you know, Laura makes a really good point. This is so neat and clean compared to the other ones that we've had over the last three months. There's only one true. person filling one slot. Um, you don't want to uh, create any other opportunities for and something. And from outside to happen, cabinet, right? right? Yes, and from yeah. outside cabinet. And one also expects that the prime minister was pretty clear to all of his remaining cabinet ministers before today. I need to know if anybody else has got yeah. any issues here because we're not going through this <laughs> again Anything another else, month. Guys? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mark, and uh, he keeps saying good day. I, I have one thing. Every last cabinet issue, he's ignored Katie's questions and said beautiful day outside too. It's not in Ottawa. It's freezing. It still is. It has been for every one of these three cabinet shuffles. Uh, Marty, picking up on sort of what we were talking about with Laura and the idea of being a team player, you had touched yeah. on this before, the opposition to TMX, for example. Uh, she she said, this is another quote, I'm, I was very committed to persuading the Prime Minister and the team that the project should not be approved. My concerns were the ones that the Federal Court of Appeal cited. I'm concerned about the marine environment, our southern resident killer whale population, and the opposition of Indigenous people. That is the solid opinion of the majority in my riding. So I was very actively meeting with the Minister and the Prime Minister and writing out my two-page analysis for caucus. I did that for the whole nine months. It was under consideration. It will again be under consideration in about it sounds like three months' time, according to natural. In a matter, yeah, in a yeah. matter of months, and and that's and that's the hedge. That's going to be your problem, team player and all. We'll see how much of a team player she is, because the thing that you have to understand with the Trudeau government uh, going into the election, the the extent to which the government uh, pinned their uh, election hopes on getting a pipeline into the ground. That one pipeline, of course, is is TMX. Uh, there is that there, there's there's consultation now with the various indigenous groups uh, that that were part of that lawsuit that were, was heard by the federal court of appeal. Uh, that's going to be up in about two and a half months. Uh, this pipeline's going into the ground. Uh, I, I don't know I don't know what. Miss Murray can possibly come out and say about, but it is going. This is this is part of the electoral gambit of getting the Liberals reelected, and not only that, there is also the, the issue of coastal gas link, uh, the, the the natural gas pipeline going up through uh, 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 northern BC. Uh, British Columbia, by dint of being on the coast, uh, is going to be uh, sort of ground zero for pipelines, uh, and therefore the, the Liberals' re-election hope. So, so it, it'd be very, very interesting to see. Like she came out very, very strongly, of course, against the TMX. Uh, whether or not she's going to whether or not she's going to do that again. Yeah, you know, and there's also something else that's going to happen between now and there's going to be an Alberta election campaign. And when Joyce Murray, from that letter you wrote, she also talked with, to about her constituents asking the question or answering the question that they would pose about what's in the national interest here. She talked about getting into the uh, climate change plan and making sure temperatures don't rise by another 1.5 degrees. And Alberta's role in that would be key. So the return or the quid pro quo would be uh, a pipeline in the ground. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen in the Alberta election campaign, but Jason Kenney, if he was to be elected, would be a very different kind of premier and change the calculus that uh, Marty just went through about what happens to the Trans Mountain Pipeline when a, a much more strident, potentially, uh, premier of Alberta might be in office. A reminder to our viewers on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter that we're going to be taking your questions. We'll be with you throughout the hour as we await the cabinet shuffle, what we know to be sort of a mini cabinet shuffle to replace uh, Jane Philpott, the former president of the Treasury Board who quit cabinet amid the uh, SNC-Lavalin controversy back on March 4th. A couple other big events, Laura, this is all happening amid, I guess you could say, and, and part of the reason I think Marty first flagged that they would want to keep this as simple as possible. Uh, we've got the first question period and in two weeks, again, back today, Jagmeet Singh, the leader of the NDP will, make, will be making his debut in the House. And then we've got that little thing called the budget tomorrow. Yeah, and a major announcement today from, from Ministers Freeland and Sajjan, right? Um, you know, the government clearly does not want to highlight the cabinet shuffle as the news event of the day today. You know, they'd rather move on to other issues. You know, this is a chance for the Liberal government to take back control of the narrative which it seems like they have not have for the past however many months we're into 2019. Um, so, you know, this this is, the, I think that they're done with talking about the internal politics of the Liberal government. And, uh, and you know, Trudeau wants to take back the reins of what his party is proposing uh, going into the next election. Uh, what's your assessment, Marty, of how big of a challenge that is at this point? 
Uh, I think they're greatly helped by the fact that they're a, a, minor, a majority government, uh, and this is why God invented majority governments is to squelch opposition and and uh, so sort of keep this. It's it's an interesting question of language. If if for the last month and a half or so, the fallout from uh, uh, the scandal with uh, with uh, Wilson Raybould has reverberated outside of Ottawa demonstrably. I was in Trudeau's riding uh, last week, and, you know, this is a liberal, liberal, liberal riding, and even people there were, were, were disgusted with it and were watching it fairly closely. What you want to see now is basically, uh, what the liberals want to see now is basically trying to keep that, uh, have it when, when people like us are talking about it, talking about cabinet, you know, you know uh, parliamentary committee and cabinet decisions and cabinet shuffles, because language like that is Ottawa jargon. Uh, and that means that it's only being talked about within Ottawa. And, it, and, and so I think what they want to do is make sure this remains an Ottawa centric scandal going forward. Uh, whether or not they'll be able to do that, you know, there's all sorts of things that can come out with Wilson Raybould. The RCMP could move, uh, come, come in. There could be uh, questions about obstruction of justice having to do with the Mark Norman case, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but uh, so, but what they would really like to do again is to basically make sure that this stays within a few square kilometers of Parliament Hill. You know, this is this is the interesting challenge. I, I think, and we've talked about this before, Avashi, that the real challenge for the government right now is to convince middle class, those middle class Canadians, they're actually better off today than they were in 2015. Uh, and certainly there's some angst about whether people believe that they have more purchasing power, whether their children will have the same kind of opportunities uh, in the future that they have today. Um, so there's lots of concern on that score. And if you look at what the SNC-Lavalin affair has, has caused, one is that it looks like preferential treatment for a company based in Quebec. Uh, it raised concerns about whether the government was really committed to doing things differently, as it said it would, that it was more transparent yeah. and accountable. All of these things begin to add to the difficulties the government has, especially when it's seeking re-election that has a majority mandate, to convince Canadians that they're worth both a second chance with a majority government, but a second chance at all. So I agree with Marty. This is the chance to, like, let's leave this in Ottawa. But they really, start ha they really do have to start focusing on those broader issues about whether Canadians are actually better off today. And we'll be talking about this tomorrow, obviously, when the budget comes, because it's the last chance they have to really tell people, here's where we're spending money, here's why you're going to be better off if these plans follow through. Where do you think, Laura, this has, uh, I, and I take Marty's point that they, uh, you know, they're hoping that this is just an Ottawa story, but they will have been meeting with their constituents over the past two weeks. Certainly, it doesn't feel like it's at the fever pitch it was three weeks ago, uh, but the idea that the questions around doing politics differently and the sort of potential hit their, their brand has taken, where do you think this has uh, caused... I mean, sort of cause questions. Yeah, I mean, I think there's no question that this has resonated beyond the Ottawa bubble, and Liberal MPs are openly talking about the fact that people in their ridings are aware of this. Um, I know I think the number one hit is just the cynicism that's associated with politics. Trudeau exactly. came in, um, you know, Mr. Sunny Ways, he's not going to take on what how Harper did how Stephen Harper did politics and that's why you see the Liberals constantly bringing up um, Stephen Harper to talk about Andrew Scheer still um, but yeah I mean it's just it's just it's that same old way of doing politics it's the cynicism it's the vote get buying um, and uh, and you know geographical concerns in Quebec um, so I think it has I, I don't think you know it, you know whether the Liberals, uh, survive this and, and, and win again either a majority or minority government, I don't think the Trudeau brand is the same as it was before this, this scandal hit Ottawa. Marty, would you agree? I agree, and the other problem that they have, I think, is uh, is just it's, a, it's just a matter of timing. Uh, you know, at the, at the turn of the year in January and, and early February, it would have been the time where they're sort of switching to the... Uh, the, the Trudeau team is switching from, you know, being in PMO to, to actually getting the guy reelected, doing message testing, uh, communications with voters, the, the various people in, involved, sort of like Katie Telford, sort of possibly leaving the PMO to go direct his uh, his his campaign. That has been stalled completely. That that is uh, that has been put on hold, and of course we don't, we no longer have Jerry Butts to, to kick around anymore. Who's not? Who's no longer in the PMO? Of course he might come back and, and help him in the in the in the, in the campaign. But again, the, the the fact is is that the, the clock is ticking, and they are they are well behind where they wanted to be at this point uh, uh, when they were planning on the on the reelection campaign.
And you're looking, if you're joining us now, at a live shot outside Rideau Hall. That's where uh, the cabinet shuffle this morning, the third in as many months for the Trudeau government, is expected to happen. We are expecting a very small shuffle. We saw Joyce Murray emerge from a car just a few moments ago. She is anticipated to be taking over for Jane Philpott, who resigned back on March 4th as President of the Treasury Board. Joyce Murray has been Parliamentary Secretary to the President of the Treasury Board, sort of um, a deputy to, to that role for the past three and a half, nearly four years. Uh, Chris, um, we were talking about a bit of the politics and, and we have viewers watching on Facebook and Twitter and they've been sending us questions throughout the past half hour. Alex Guibor on YouTube asks, do you think Joyce Murray was kept out of cabinet until now because she had to prove herself as a team player after competing against Trudeau for the Liberal leadership? Oh, that's an interesting yeah. question. Uh, I, 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 don't, uh, I, don't, I don't profess to know how the Prime Minister treated his opponent, <laughs> but it was a comfortable win for him back in 2013. Um, I think it was more a victim of numbers. There were other people from British Columbia that he wanted to appoint, Carla Qualtrough obviously being one of them, uh, Jody Wilson-Raybould obviously being another. Um, so her turn just wasn't uh, there at the time. The Lower Mainland was already well represented. Um, she's not the most effective community. She's actually quite quiet and introverted for most politicians, but um, uh, seemed to be very capable. So I think it was more a matter of he had other people he felt he needed to put in the positions to represent, uh, in, in Jody Wilson-Raybould's case, obviously Indigenous communities as well. Well, so it just wasn't her turn. Well, Laura, when we talk about this um, controversy that precipitated this cabinet shuffle and the, and the one before it, I guess, not the first one, uh, talk a little bit about, if you don't mind, the potential for it to persist. Uh, like, what kind of factors would go into that? I note that your piece about Jane Philpott over the weekend, we still haven't heard from her other than the letter that she presented saying she had lost confidence, essentially, in the way the Prime Minister had handled the matter. Uh, we know that Jody Wilson-Raybould, the, there's the potential for her to reappear before the Justice Committee. They will be meeting again tomorrow, uh, admittedly in behind closed doors, uh, to debate whether or not she should reappear. We know that she's willing to. Uh, what is the potential, I guess, for this, even though this cabinet shuffle is sort of, as we've been discussing, an attempt to, to kind of close the book on this and move past it? And there are some other big items coming up, but what is the potential? What are the sort of key factors that might keep it going? Yeah, I mean, they're having their own mini lockup tomorrow in the, in the committee meeting while the journalists are locked up in the budget. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, we haven't heard from from Jane Philpott. Um, you know, as I said earlier, Jody Wilson-Raybould has been very vocal about expressing her desire to run again as a liberal liberal MP. We haven't heard that from Jane Philpott. You know, we also had the Caesar, uh, Selena Caesar Chavan um, interview with the Globe and Mail, where she talked about um, being met with hostility and anger from um, Prime Minister Trudeau when she, she tried to leave politics. We don't know if other members of, of the caucus um, are feeling the same and if there's, if there's going to be sides taken, I suppose, in this fight. I mean, um, you know, they've been, we haven't seen a caucus meeting in Ottawa for a couple of weeks due to, a, due to the break. So it, it'll be really interesting to talk to some backbenchers and some other Liberal MPs to see what the mood is like in caucus. I mean, how can, um, how can Jody Wilson-Raybould and, and Jane Philpott go back and be part of the team after they've just expressed a loss of confidence yeah. Yeah. in the prime minister and what does that do to the mood and the tone in the room um, is there a trust issue there i mean we've, we've heard a lot about the erosions of trust that went on between the prime minister's office uh, and these former cabinet ministers but i think the caucus dynamic is one to watch and and if other mps come out and start speaking out against the government or taking sides uh, against the Prime Minister's office. Yeah, Marty, they've kind of settled on this line that, that differences are, are okay in caucus and that it's fine for the yeah. two of them to remain as Liberals. But you've got to wonder, logistically, uh, pragmatically, how is that going to work? It doesn't. I don't know how it does. I'll be perfectly honest, because, because look, uh, people like us, journalists, uh, are hanging off every single word that she says. Uh, anytime she comes out with something, uh, it spawns the, you know, uh, pieces in the newspaper. We talk about it on television. Yada yada. You're on the campaign trail. Imagine this: she's out there uh, campaigning, and every time she moves, she's going to get asked about this. She's going to become. I mean, it's it's basically if if she were to stay in caucus, it is basically a, an invitation to keep the Jody Wilson Raybould scandal of February seventh that began February seventh with that piece in the Globe and Mail to being a story all the way up into the election. Uh, and she will she will. Eat oxygen that was other that should otherwise be consumed by the re, uh, the uh, re-election um, uh, campaign of the, of the Liberals. I don't, I don't, I don't see how uh, the, the, how Trudeau would want to keep her in there uh, by being basically a ready-made narrative against himself. Mm -hmm.
Well, I was going to say that uh, Jane Philpott is widely respected in the caucus. Let's stick with her for a moment. I'll get back to Marty's point about Jody Wilson-Raybould in a moment. Jane Philpott's widely respected, a steady hand. Uh, among the newcomers was probably the most accomplished member of his cabinet. Uh, you could make an argument perhaps for Jim Carr and Carla Qualter as well, but clearly very proficient, very much in command, and dealt with some of the most difficult files that could have been handed to her, including Indigenous services, to try to deliver on those uh, programs to, to make real the, the promise that the Prime Minister had made that this being was the most important relationship uh, between Crown and, and Indigenous people. Um, she's also on the outside. So both of them profess to continue to believe in the liberal values, the liberal policies, the liberal agenda, except for this one incident involving whether or not there was improper pressure applied. Uh, I'm not sure how you can square those. I've talked, and I'm sure others have too, to a number of Liberal MPs who obviously don't want to go on the record, but they're concerned about it. They're concerned about whether they are on the same page. Uh, they're concerned about what they hear at the door, which is uh, really about this campaign, about this uh, SNC-Lavalin affair. Uh, it's not just an Ottawa bubble story. So uh, I don't know to what extent uh, there's an, a, a move to get rid of them. I think that would be very difficult if it was seen to be led from the Prime Minister's office. Uh, on the other hand, it is difficult, I think, for all of those people who are sitting in the caucus with them to, to say, difficult. look, you're on the same team as me, but you have this fundamental difference. You've lost confidence in the prime minister. You've done so openly. Uh, we haven't heard the end of it. Yeah, I don't think there's a single MP I've spoken with who doesn't say this is nuts. Yeah, like it's, it's like very to be difficult. transparent, you know, well, both, yeah. both what transpired, but also the fact that they have left cabinet, but, but and, and say they That's have no the confidence, thing, yeah. but stay in caucus. And is and, and I would just add, you know, is there resentment there um, in caucus towards, um, especially Jody Wilson-Raybould, who some Liberal MPs say has hurt their chances um, in the next election? You know, if if the government's brought down to a minority, or if they lose the election, um, you know, f fears that this could impact their electoral chances are brewing within the caucus. So. To have her remain in there would be, I think, quite tense for some of the MPs. And we are just, again, looking at a live shot outside Rideau Hall. Uh, the precursor to this third cabinet shuffle in as many months is what we've been discussing, the controversy surrounding SNC-Lavalin and the allegations uh, made by uh, Jody Wilson-Raybould, the former Justice Minister, that she was inappropriately pressured by members of the Prime Minister's office and others in the government to intervene in uh, a criminal case against SNC-Lavalin. And Janice, I just want to bring you back because you're standing there outside of Rideau Hall. We've got questions coming in uh, via social media on YouTube and Twitter and Facebook. They're watching this uh, stream live there as well. Tite Janice on YouTube asks, do you think there will be another cabinet shuffle before the election? Oh boy, let me just gaze into my crystal yeah. ball. <laughs> if <laughs> so, maybe, maybe on a warmer day. Yeah, right. I, that's what I said after the last one though, Vashi. I'm not going to say that again. I'm not going <laughs> to tempt fate. Um, uh, seriously, what I would say is, on the one hand, we have seen a lot of unexpected things happen over the last couple of weeks. Um, but on the other hand, uh, CBC News did contact all of the uh, current cabinet ministers and ask them if, uh, you know, they uh, completely support the prime minister. And all of them said yes. So if we saw another resignation at this point, I think it would be unexpected because it would be presumably a reversal of what they have come out and said publicly over the last couple of weeks. So I guess that's that's one thing to consider. It would be shocking for the prime minister to probably make any more changes that weren't forced upon him. So I think that would be another argument against. But as I said, you know, we've all been conditioned never to say never now. I think after the way the last couple of months have gone, I also want to just pick up on the point that you were just raising about uh, the two former ministers continuing to sit in caucus. I think it is worth remembering that there's precedence for this. Uh, those of us who covered the previous government under Prime Minister Stephen Harper uh, remember a cabinet minister named Michael Chong who resigned in principle from that cabinet, but continued to sit in the caucus, albeit uneasily. He was somewhat of an outsider on the inside of that caucus for a long time. Uh, there were a lot of uh, feelings that were difficult uh, between him and uh, some other people involved with that government, but he broadly still supported Mr. Harper's agenda. He ran again as a 
conservative a couple of times, then ran for the leadership of the party and put forward some alternate uh, policy suggestions and had a little base of, of his own supporters. Um, so we have seen this before. It is not something that's entirely unexpected in Canadian politics. In fact, it's been done in very recent memory. Uh, I would be interested to know to what extent these two uh, former ministers might be thinking about that as they contemplate running again. Uh, we have heard from them some of the same things we used to hear from Mike Chong about how they support the rest of the agenda. It was just on sort of these fundamental issues that they weren't able to continue uh, in cabinet. So, um, you know, I, I disagree that this is uh, something that can't work or can't last because we do have a fairly recent precedent uh, for a situation that the Conservatives anyway were able to uh, more or less make work, albeit imperfectly, but they kept them in the tent instead of pushing them out of it and, and particularly with the profiles and, and the skills that these two women bring, uh, the support that they have with them, I think there's a strong argument for keeping them on the inside because uh, forcing them out uh, would have serious consequences. I actually think that would keep the story going more uh, than keeping them on the inside. Eventually, we're going to uh, get tired of asking them the same questions uh, and getting the same answers. That's a good point. We're just looking inside now. The shot has switched for those of you watching, and we're, we're inside Rideau Hall where we are waiting any minute now the swearing-in ceremony. Just a simple one, we're told, just a, about five minutes long. We are anticipating that Joyce Murray will move into the portfolio, president of the Treasury Board, uh, that Jane Philpott held before she resigned from Cabinet uh, on March 4th. And, and Chris, that's what we've been discussing, that the two of them, uh, Jody Wilson-Raybould and Jane Philpott, want to remain in caucus. Uh, a lot of MPs have trouble with that. Janice bringing up that Michael Chong did it. A few differences between the uh, matters on which they're I mean, expressing yeah, One, one resigned as a matter of principle over the recognition of the Quebecois as, as a nation uh, versus saying that there was an effort to improperly interfere with the duties of the Attorney General. I think it's slightly different on that part, but uh, uh, it does remain a very live question. I don't disagree with Janice to the point that uh, if they were to if, if they were to, to be moved out right. of caucus, it would keep the issue alive further still. As I indicated earlier, it will not come from the Prime Minister's office. I guess it would Clearly he's made from... the decision not to, right? Because exactly. he had said prior, I'm waiting to listen to the testimony, I'm thinking about, like he had sort of kicked the can down the road a little bit, and, and then he understood finally the peril said, no, if no. he was seen to do that, especially with Jody Wilson-Raybould, and now with, uh, with uh, Jane Philpott, one, uh, an Indigenous woman from British Columbia, the other a very competent woman from, from uh, Ontario. Just You can't be seen to be orchestrating their ouster from caucus. Marty, you want to jump in there? Sorry. Well, it's just, uh, uh, Chris talked a bit about the, the differences between Michael Chong and, and the, the current situation. The similarity, of course, is that this was uh, recognizing the Quebecois as a, as a, as a uh, nation. Uh, again, it was another issue that was broadly seen across the country as being pandering to Quebec. Uh, fast forward, you know, 12 years, and here we are with SNC Lavalin, and cries across the country that uh, basically Quebec is being favorable. And so some things change and some things don't. Laura, yeah, that idea that, that Chris and Marty both touched on in Janice, that uh, kicking them out of caucus, I mean, while it may appear untenable to remain in, it would almost be more untenable to kick them out, at least politically speaking. And, and a reminder, we're looking inside uh, Rideau Hall right now. At the, we're awaiting the, the swearing-in ceremony for, we anticipate, Joyce Murray to take over for Jane Philpott. Laura? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Another element of this story is is how much more does Jody Wilson-Raybould want to tell? I mean, she said she does want to speak um, about her the time that she resigned, um, the time between that she was appointed uh, as Veterans Affairs Minister and then resigned. She hasn't been able to speak openly about that, and she said that she is prepared to um, to go back to the committee to speak to that. So, how much does she push? To, um, to tell her side of the story and how much does she want to keep this going because she has expressed a desire to do that. And we know that the committee is going to be speaking about it tomorrow, but she could, you know, she, she could be openly talking about talking with reporters about this um, after caucus meeting this week that she does, in fact, want to tell more of her story. Yeah, it's interesting, so Chris. She could she, keep it going as she well. Could. She wrote a letter to her constituents last week in which she said there are more, more details to tell. She's put out a statement uh, after the debate around whether or not she should appear before the committee for a second time sort of saying I'm willing to so far her interpretation though has been yeah, that she can only talk about the time up until she was shifted out of Attorney General and she only has done that before and, and nobody else seems to share that view except her that she is prohibited from speaking about anything that took place while she was veterans uh, minister so yeah I, you'd wonder why she continues to leave it out there that she is prepared to tell more and leaving Unless it in somebody else's quarter what more there might maybe to tell um, so she's not helping the cause in that regard and I, I think there was a, a 
subtle shift for a lot of people when uh, it turned out that she had said both that, the, that no laws were broken uh, and that, uh, that in the course of this that she was uh, continuing to claim a solicitor client privilege when no one else seemed to think that there really was one uh, extended to her time as Veterans Affairs Minister. Uh, those I think uh, had an impact on folks saying well hang on a second um, maybe maybe this is now not just the one side we're hearing but the, the other side has got some points too about she was given the opportunity to make the final decision and whether she liked it or not or how this whole thing un untold she did make that final decision who knows it just remains yeah. a live issue every time she opens her mouth on this. yeah and marty i mean the main yeah. question that we don't have an answer to is why miss wilson raybould resigned i mean that that is the the period of time that she and and to be fair she might be getting that advice from her lawyer she was consulting with former justice um uh, supreme court justice thomas cromwell on yeah. what she could she can and can't say but her interpretation has been a very narrow one of the period in which she can speak and that the big question that's not covered by that waiver according to her of that's course right. would be why she actually resigned like what happened because remember the prime minister said her presence in cabinet ironically on cabinet shuffle day speaks for itself yeah and and uh if if indeed she is being silent on the issue because of the advice she's getting to mr cromwell then i defer to mr cromwell he knows a hell of a lot more about this than i do uh I mean, the interesting, I, I just come back to her idea of running again as a liberal. I spoke a little bit earlier about how, uh, you know, it's probably to Trudeau's advantage to, to, I don't want to say get rid of her, but to kick her out of caucus completely. It speaks a little bit to the to the rock and the hard place he's in, because just imagine, imagine that scenario where she is kicked out of caucus and runs again in a riding. I can't see a situation right now, I mean, again, you know, a lot of things can change, where she doesn't win that. And all of a sudden, or not, not even not even win. Like let's back up from there. Uh, you have to have, you have a situation where Justin Trudeau has to appoint a liberal to run against her. Uh, imagine the optics of that. Yeah. No, for sure. Um, so we're, we're once again looking in to Rideau Hall. We're awaiting the swear, swearing in ceremony for uh, Joyce Murray, we anticipate, who will take over for Jane Philpott, who quit cabinet amid the controversy we've been discussing for the last little while, the SNC Lavalin controversy. Uh, Jane Philpott quit cabinet back on March 4th. Uh, just a few days before that, on March 1st, we, first, I'm sorry, we saw the second cabinet shuffle, which was prompted by Jody Wilson Raybould's resignation from cabinet back in the middle of February. And that first cabinet shuffle that started this all started the ball rolling on this all was in the middle of uh, January Laura we've been talking about a lot of the politics uh, behind all of this again we're looking inside the room waiting for Joyce Murray to to take um, take over for Jane Philpot we've we've touched on some of the the political calculations behind picking uh, Joyce Murray and, and there certainly are a lot of political calculations that go into every cabinet decision Absolutely. I mean, I, th I think we see it's a pretty intimate affair. Um, you know, this isn't a huge cabinet shuffle. The, the government clearly did not want to mess around with any other ministerial, ministerial portfolios in this one. And, and by putting Joyce Murray in the post, they'll, they'll simply have to replace her as a parliamentary secretary, which is a lot less complicated than moving chess pieces around in the other portfolios. And that hasn't worked out so well for the government over the past couple of months. Um, I, you know, I think it's also telling the fact that the prime minister apparently won't be taking questions today because um, Vashi, you talked about, you know, his comments last time saying Jody Wilson-Raybould's presence in cabinet speaks for itself. Um, you know, I think they want to downplay this as much as they can, move on to other issues, um, you know, such as the budget tomorrow and just try to put this behind them, put a steady hand into their portfolio and move on. Chris Joyce Murray is the parliamentary secretary to the president of the Treasury Board, has been since the Liberals' election uh, initially right out right at in 2015. Uh, brings a lot of experience to the table, was a provincial MLA environment minister under Gordon Campbell. Also, um, you know, very vocal about a number of positions, specifically around the environment and the, the TMX pipeline. Uh, Laura mentioned picking from outside of cabinet, right? Uh, kind of important in this time. We saw what happened in January when there was a not that that didn't happen and instead there was a shuffle around and that did that kind of backfired so this this keeps things simple this keeps things simple and I, i'm just looking at I, i'm probably going to miss one but we have jonathan wilkinson who's from vancouver uh, as the oceans and fisheries minister we have carla qualtro who's in public uh, services we have arjeet sajan the defense minister joyce murray a lot of cabinet ministers from the vancouver area specifically which again shows you how important that is politically to the fortunes of the party liberal party heading into the next election campaign a very key area obviously uh, and for Joyce Murray, she is, I, I, I think we 
have to say a very safe choice at this point. Treasury Board is not the most high profile position. I don't expect we'll see or hear a lot from her. Uh, it is so in control of, um, of the way money is spent and to make sure it's spent appropriately. So a very key factor in all of this. Uh, Scott Bryson did it before that. He was replaced by, uh, when, he, when he decided to leave, he was replaced by, by Jane Philpott, who had been the deputy chair of the uh, cabinet committee of the uh, of Treasury Board. Um, so they're trying to keep it within the circle of people who have some knowledge about how Treasury Board works and how government spending and expenditures are monitored. So this minimizes any risks of another cabinet minister, but it also keeps somebody in, in a position that is actually very vital to the government's fortunes, particularly heading into an election year. If you're just joining us now, I'm Vashi Capellos, and you're watching a special edition of Power and Politics, special Monday morning edition. We are looking live inside Rideau Hall, where we are anticipating the third cabinet shuffle from the Trudeau government in as many months. Joyce Murray anticipated to take over for outgoing Treasury President Jane Philpott, who quit cabinet uh, in the middle of that SNC-Lavalin controversy back in the middle of March. Uh, Marty, let me bring you in and talk a bit about the, what Chris highlighted, and that is the politics behind uh, B.C. He very helpfully laid out the, the number of cabinet ministers in B.C. Talk a bit about some of the challenges uh, the Trudeau government might face in B.C. and why that province is, is important to their electoral fortunes. Well, again, as I said before, a lot of it is about pipelines. Uh, the, the government is sort of like almost back backloaded by, by dint of what has happened in the last little while. The government has basically backloaded a lot of the stuff that they wanted to do into the latter part of the mandate. Uh, they didn't anticipate that TMX would take this long. They didn't anticipate the uh, sort of the broad sort of uh, revolt. I don't want to say revolt. It's probably too strong a word. But the, the protests against uh, coastal gas link. Uh, regardless, I, I understand that Mr. Trudeau has always said that. And there's you know, Michael the, Warnick, the, 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 the most the, of the Privy Council oh, walking in. Sorry, I think we're just getting ready to see a little bit of a procession. Yep. And we just saw Michael Warnick, uh, who's a big part of the swearing Good in. Good morning. Oh, and, welcome and let's to listen. And I think we've got the ceremony Bonjour starting bienvenue now. À Rideau Hall. To begin this swearing in ceremony of a member of the 29th Canadian Ministry, please rise and welcome the minister designate, the prime minister, and the Governor General of Canada. Pour débuter cette cérémonie d'assermentation de membres du 29e Conseil des ministres canadiens, veuillez vous lever et accueillir la ministre désignée, le premier ministre et la gouverneure générale du Canada. Please be seated. Veuillez vous asseoir. The clerk of the Privy Council will now seek the Governor's General's consent to proceed. Le greffier du Conseil privé demandera maintenant à la Gouverneure Générale la permission de procéder. With the Governor's General's approval, we will now proceed with the ceremony. Maintenant que la Gouverneure Générale a signifié son approbation, nous procéderons à la cérémonie. The Minister Designate, who is not a member of the Privy Council, will please come forward to take the Oath of Allegiance, the Privy Councillor's Oath, and the Oath of Office. La Ministre Désignée, qui ne fait pas partie du Conseil Privé, est priée de s'avancer pour prêter le serment d'allégeance, le serment des conseils privés et le serment de fils. Miss Joyce Murray, President of the Treasury Board and Minister of Digital Government. Madame Joyce Murray, Présidente du Conseil du Trésor et Ministre du Gouvernement numérique. I, Joyce Murray, do declare that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, Queen of Canada, her heirs and successors. I, Joyce Murray, do solemnly and sincerely declare that I shall be a true and faithful servant to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II as a member of Her Majesty's Privy Council for Canada. I will in all things to be treated, debated, and resolved in Privy Council 
faithfully, honestly, and truly declare my mind and my opinion. I shall keep secret all matters committed and revealed to me in this capacity or that shall be secretly treated of in council. Generally, in all things, I shall do as a faithful and true servant ought to do for Her Majesty. Moi, Joyce Murray, I, je déclare Joyce, Joyce Murray, do solemnly and, sincere and sincerely promise and declare that I will truly and faithfully Canada, and to the best of my skill and knowledge exec execute the powers and trust reposed in me. Joyce Murray, I, Joyce Murray, do solemnly and sincerely declare that I shall be a true and faithful servant to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II as a member of Her Majesty's Privy Council for Canada. I will in all things to be treated, debated and resolved in Privy Council, faithfully, honestly and truly declare my mind and my opinion. I shall keep secret all matters committed and revealed to me in this capacity or that shall be secretly treated of in Council. Generally, in all things, I shall do as a faithful and true servant ought to do for Her Majesty. I, Joyce Murray, do solemnly and sincerely promise and declare that I will truly and faithfully, and to the best of my skill and knowledge, execute the powers and trusts reposed in me as President of the Treasury Board and Minister of Digital Government. Moi, Joyce Murray, I, Joyce Murray, do solemnly and sincerely promise and declare that I will truly and faithfully, and to the best of my skill and knowledge, execute the powers and trust reposed in me as Minister responsible for the Treasury Board and Digital Government. And there we have it, pretty short, pretty sweet, the cabinet swearing in uh, ceremony for Joyce Murray. You'll see her there uh, signing some documentation. She's just being sworn in by the Prime Minister, the Clerk of the Privy Council, and Governor General Julie Payette. The she Governor officially General, the Prime Minister, takes over for Jane Philpott, who resigned from cabinet back on March 4th. La Gouverneur générale, we'll le Premier ministre et le greffier du Conseil privé apposeront maintenant leur signature sur le registre des serments. And now Governor General Julie Payette is signing again, as we were saying, just a, a short ceremony uh, confirming that Joyce Murray does take over for Jane Philpott. Chris, no surprises there. No, and she certainly, if I, if I could, looks a lot happier <laughs> than, uh, than Jody Wilson-Raybould did when she was shuffled out uh, last time around. So, um, yeah, it's, it's no surprise. Uh, I, I, she's obviously the, the, the right person in terms of geography, in terms of uh, gender, and in terms of the interest that she has in the, uh, in, in the Vancouver area. So uh, all, all of those things aside, given the fact that she's now been Parliamentary Secretary of the Treasury Board since 2015, like in, in the entirety of this, uh, this government, uh, this is continuity. 
and tra uh, doing the kind of the traditional thing uh, in, in terms of putting her in this place. And we're looking right now at Michael Wernick, the clerk of the Privy Council, who has become a kind of well-known figure over the past three weeks. He's the top, pub the country's top public servant, Ladies but he's been embroiled in, in this SNC-Lavalin controversy as well, having testified before the Justice Committee the a few times. Please join me in congratulating uh, the new member and of And I believe the they're just closing Canadian out the ceremony ministry. there. Mesdames et Messieurs, pour terminer la cérémonie, applaudissons le nouveau membre du 29e Conseil des ministres. Round of applause for Joyce Murray, who again takes over for Jane Philpott, uh, Treasury, President of the Treasury Board, who quit March 4th following uh, everything that happened with the SNC-Lavalin controversy. And we're going to follow, of course, this ceremony so you can keep looking inside. We are, just so that you know what to anticipate, also waiting for Joyce Murray to emerge from this ceremony. And she is expected to address reporters while Prime Minister Trudeau, who in the past, under more, uh, uh, under bigger, I guess you could say, cabinet shuffles, has talked to reporters and answered questions. This one, Laura, is very different for a number of reasons. Yeah, that's right. I mean, uh, you know, the Prime Minister's office doesn't really want to highlight this because then we have to go back and remind the public why this cabinet shuffle is actually taking place. Um, but, you know, this is this is the practical choice. I think that this makes sense. Um, you know, it keeps it simple. They don't have to move any other ministers around. Joyce Murray, who has been the parliamentary secretary in this file, moves up and um, and they just have to simply fill her role there. Um, you know, we've talked about uh, about the fact that she's been outspoken on the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Um, I don't think that the Prime Minister or his office actually minds this, um, because you know, if you if you look back to what he's said when Jane Philpott resigned, for instance, he said, you know, we welcome debate and diverse voices um, in our cabinet and our caucus. Um, you know, this could be an example of that that they're bringing in. Um, you know. A, people who are opposed to this vision and saying that they're listening to them and they want to take all the environmental concerns uh, into account. So, um, you know, I think this this is probably makes the most sense uh, in terms of where this cabinet shuffle needed to go. That pipeline issue, Marty, will be an interesting yeah. one. And for those of you watching, we're, we're, we have been looking at the swearing-in ceremony at Rideau Hall for Joyce Murray, who takes over for Jane Philpott. This is a special edition of Power and Politics and a very special edition of the Power Panel. We've got Chris Hall, host of the House, Laura Stone with the Globe and Mail, and Marty Patroquin uh, with iPolitics. Uh, Laura was sort of highlighting this idea of uh, that, that, that the Liberals want to sort of turn the page. We've got the budget coming, a whole bunch of stuff coming up. Um, uh, and that this this wasn't necessarily a, a cabinet shuffle by it wasn't a cabinet shuffle by choice at all actually it, th that they don't want to be talking about the reasons that led them to this. Uh, yeah, exactly, and, and I mean along the lines of, the, of what you were saying about the pipelines, there, you know, uh, Joyce Murray's criticism of TMX uh, was was interesting, and it was an interesting bit of diplomacy uh, that she was against it because of her constituents about uh, you know. Um, uh, the conversation or lack thereof with uh, the local indigenous groups, et cetera, et cetera, that were po opposed to it. But she couched it in a greater issue of being, you know, this is for the greater good. We, we need this because the greater good of the national interest. We need to bring this pipeline in, even though I'm personally against it, in, in order to get Alberta in, involved. Uh, and I think that's the kind of uh, ideological, what's the word, ideological uh, hedging, I guess you could almost say, that Trudeau probably welcomes because it allows them to say, look, we have, we have, do have concerns about pipelines, but for the greater good of, of, uh, of the country and, of course, for the environment, because we bring it to bring in the carbon tax with Alberta, which was the grand bargain, uh, this is something to which we can acquiesce. The only caveat I would, I would ask about, uh, Chris, is that I remember when the decision first came down and Joyce Murray, we, you know, everyone, uh, everyone ran up her. to caucus yeah. and, we all, and we all chased her. Now she's a cabinet minister say, saying that kind of stuff. Does that make a difference? Well, I shall be, I I surely be asked uh, today uh, what, what this says about uh, her ability to speak out on issues on behalf of her constituents, something as important as the Trans Mountain Pipeline, which will clearly be an election issue in, in, in Vancouver and, and the British Columbia writ large. Large. So uh, it, it, it is an interesting angle that she was, or want line she's going to have to walk between cabinet solidarity and belief that this is a balancing act of national economic interest, as we talked about earlier, uh, is being met by the commitment to get Alberta to bring in a climate change plan. Um, the other thing uh, out of all of this is that uh, we still have Bill C-69 working its way through the Senate. Do, just for yes. those to remind people, that's the new 
environmental review process for projects just like the Trans Mountain yes. Pipeline, which was approved under the old conservative rules. So it will be a challenging issue, and she will be one of the people who have now to take the lead in arguing the Liberal government's position in an election campaign about why this is the right choice, why buying it was in the national interest, and ultimately, I guess, can they find a seller or a buyer for the pipeline because they don't want to be the permanent owners. Jan, and let's head back to Janice McGregor. She's she's on the ground there at Rideau Hall. You can see they're doing a white balance, getting set up at the podium for Joyce Murray to come out and address reporters. Uh, Janice, I know you have covered uh, Miss Murray for a while. Uh, tell us about your thoughts on this pick. Yeah, interesting to see what kind of a style she brings to Treasury Board. A, a quick story, uh, going back, I think, seven or eight years now, um, when I was covering her, uh, when she was an opposition critic uh, during the previous government, um, there was one day when I had reached out to her uh, to do a short interview for comment on, I don't remember what the story was, actually, of how she, um, but uh, as luck would have it that day, I, yeah, possibly, right? Um, it, anyway, it doesn't matter for the story. I had a sick preschooler that day, and as luck would have it as a working mom, I got the call in the middle of the day that I needed to go pick up my kid, and I was in that unenviable uh, position of trying to file from home when she returned my call so I could get her quote. And I had this screaming child in the background, but I was trying to do my job for the CBC and, and file the quotes anyway. And she stopped me, Ms. Murray did, a mid-phone call. And she said, Janice, it sounds like you've got a lot going on there right now. She said, me and my husband, when we were trying to build up our reforestation build business, I was also trying to raise three kids as a working mom. I know what you're going through. And she told me, she said, look, do what you have to do with your child, and then call me back and I'll make sure that my staff put the call through because this is important to you. It's important to me that everything works and we all get what we need today. And I thought, wow, um, that was kind of an interesting statement, I think, about her approach to life, her approach to doing her job as a politician. And I, I certainly appreciate it in terms of um, how, how she got me in that moment. And I've told this story to several people when she ran for the Liberal leadership and in the years since, people who know her far better than I do. And they said that really is her style. She is a very pragmatic person. She is a problem solver. She looks for the compromise uh, in situations where there is a difficulty. Uh, it is not about her ego first. Uh, she is, uh, as we've been saying all morning, very much a team player um, and someone who is looking out to try and get things done for everyone. And so it'll be interesting to see a president of the Treasury Board with kind of that personal orientation, not a gregarious person, not an extrovert, uh, more introvert, introverted personality, uh, but some Someone who, who uh, definitely has been known as someone with a, a big picture perspective and, and takes the long view over kind of short term crises. Um, so these are perhaps skills that uh, will be needed at Treasury Board. Um, I think probably a good fit to uh, Brand Trudeau as well. Um, and, uh, I, you know, when she comes out to take questions, uh, hopefully before uh, too much longer, we'll see uh, kind of what her early messaging is as, as she takes on this new role. Yeah, and that's what we're waiting for there. If you look at that shot of the podium, we are uh, awaiting uh, Joyce Murray to come out and, and talk to reporters. Speaking of her family there, Laura, we know that her son Eric recently had a pretty serious accident in Mexico. That's kind of the last time that we had been talking about Joyce Murray, that, that her name was in the news prior to today, uh, was because her son did suffer that accident uh, Mexico broke a lot of bones, from my understanding. I know that he was taken out by medevac, I think, and, and is being treated, but his recovery is anticipated to be uh, really long. She said at the time that, that the prime minister called her. Justin called, and we spoke for at least 15 minutes. He has a family of his own and understood what this meant. He told me to take all the time I needed to deal with the situation. Again, an expression of support for the prime minister. We've been talking throughout the hour, Laura, about even though she, she has some very uh, uh, disparate views on some big issues like the environment, like pipelines, uh, that she has constantly taken the opportunity to express her loyalty to the prime minister and that this would be a more traditional pick for a cabinet minister as a result. Uh, absolutely, Vashi. I think, I think that's key. There's a sense that Joyce Murray, you know, gets politics. She, she's been a cabinet minister in the, in the B.C. government. She ran for leadership. She's been an MP for a decade, and she, she understands um, how it works and that, you know, you can have disparate views, but you also need to be a team player. And I think that's going to be, you know, key on her message today when she takes reporters' questions. I'm sure she'll be asked 
um, you know, about her confidence in the prime minister, seeing as she's filling in, she's taking over the post from Jane Philpott, who said she had lost confidence in the way that this um, this government handled the SNC Lavalin affair, and, and she will be asked about pipeline. But I think what we're going to what we're going to hear from Joyce Murray is that she has confidence in this government. She believes in the greater good of what the government is doing, and she's here for the team. And that word confidence, yeah. Marty, is, is an important one, given what we've heard from uh, Jody Wilson-Raybould and from mm -hmm. Jane Philpott, who specifically in her resignation f letter, for example, which prompted this very cabinet shuffle, expressed that she had lost, lost confidence, mm -hmm. it, right. used that word specifically in the prime minister and in the way in which the prime minister and the government had handled the ensuing uh, sort of controversy from the SNC-Lavalin uh, debacle. Yeah, and I, I don't want to take away from Joyce Murray's day. I mean, this is her day and everything like this. But I think the more interesting story in the next few months is, is, isn't going to be in caucus. Isn't, pardon me, isn't going to be in cabinet. It's going to be in, in caucus in the backbench. Uh, the Globe and Mail did an interesting uh, exercise about three weeks ago, and I think CBC has done something similar. They went out and asked every single liberal that they could find, uh, you know, do you have confidence in them? And, and if you look at what the, the people that the Globe and Mail harvested quotes from, it was almost to a man and woman uh, was almost all cabinet. Uh, the people that didn't respond or, or didn't have much to say uh, were all were all in caucus. We're all backbench, um, and it sort of underscores the the fact that you know, coming into 2015, Pierre uh, <laughs> I just called him Pierre Trudeau, Justin Trudeau uh, wasn't going to replicate exactly what his dad did. What, what his dad started, that is to say, the all powerful PMO, uh, you know, top down sort of type of management. And, you know, fast forward four years and you can't help but think that that is exactly what uh, Justin Trudeau has wrought uh, in the Liberal Party. That is to say, the PMO still remains as strong as it was, as strong as even it was during the Stephen Harper years, uh, which Justin Trudeau never ceased to criticize. Uh, so all this to say is that I, I don't think we're going to, uh, I don't think, again, this is, you know, crystal ball territory, but I don't think we're going to see another cabinet shuffle simply because everybody in there has already professed their, how, how confident they are in Justin Trudeau. Uh, I don't necessarily think it's going to be the same thing in caucus and the backbench. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that. In fact, the letter that you read from Joyce Murray earlier uh, in response to Jody Wilson-Raybould and Jane Philpott's resignation, uh, she talked about uh, truly diverse and representative cabinets, a range of perspectives on a common event should be considered healthy and normal. Uh, we already know she has a different perspective on whether TMX should be bought, uh, and she, but she believes that the cabinet solidarity and, and the support of the government, uh, that she had to fall in line with this decision. Uh, to the caucus question, I don't want to put too much into this. I think most of them are feeling that they... That as they went through the doors uh, earlier this year and certainly in the past two weeks, that this is a live issue, the whole SNC-Lavalin affair and how it was handled and whether the prime minister's office, whether they broke the law or not, certainly uh, did not respect her, uh, Jody Wilson-Raybould's request to, to leave it alone. It was her decision and her decision had been made. Uh, so there is that part of it. Uh, I think they're all now generally interested in getting reelected here. We've seen those who have decided not point. to run, who face the biggest challenges. Um, people like uh, T.J. Harvey and Tobik Maktikwak's not running again. Uh, we understand that for those people who are on ridings that are going to be competitive with the Conservatives, they need now to have a fully supportive team going forward to be able to focus on the issues uh, that begin tomorrow with the budget. So we'll see how that works out, but it's certainly a big deal. Let's listen in. The Prime Minister is leaving now. I think there's some questions being shouted at him, or there were. <laughs> oh, he's in the car. Never mind. So, like we anticipated, no, no, uh, no, his day. no questions today. Not even a good day, like he said. On, it's a good day outside, like he said on the way in. I know our colleagues there were attempting to ask questions. We will see the Prime Minister, though, Laura, uh, later today. He's expected to be in question period. It's also uh, NDP leader Jagmeet Singh's first appearance uh, at question period and in the House. Uh, he was sworn in, I believe, yesterday. Uh, and uh, and then we're anticipating a, a statement on, of course, the, the tragedy in Christchurch. The Prime Minister is expected to make a statement, I believe, at around 3 o'clock Eastern. So no, and then of course we've got we've got the budget tomorrow. So no, no shortage of uh, appearances before the before uh, of the prime minister, but no no questions, and not really a surprise considering. I mean, we were remarking when we were watching the swearing in ceremony. It it is a bit odd to see it for the third time, <laughs> and you know it's it, it, there's a difference between, and there really is a difference between the the bigger shuffles or even the first swearing in ceremony where there's a lot of pride on everyone's faces, and this one where it's kind of like awkward. I feel like because everybody knows. And we, we're only here because someone quit and they said that they didn't have confidence in the prime minister.
Yeah, I mean, think about that first, that very first cabinet shuffle where, where Prime Minister Trudeau is, is walking down the driveway at Rideau Hall with all his cabinet ministers, um, you know, walking behind him, waving, um, you know, a time of celebration, uh, uh, if you will. Now we've got three shuffles into the first year of, 20, of an election year in 2019 because ministers keep quitting. I mean, this isn't something that the, the government uh, wants to highlight, obviously. Um, uh, you know, Trudeau doesn't want to, want to be in pieces, in TV pieces tonight or, or in the newspaper, um, you know, with the backdrop of he said at this cabinet shuffle to replace Jane Philpott, who quit uh, over a loss of confidence. They don't want to highlight this. This is the chance for the government to move on. Um, to take back control of the narrative, which they've lost over the past several weeks. But a lot. But I think the big um, issue for the government now is that a lot is still out of their control. Um, you know, whether whether Jody Wilson-Raybould, um, you know, wants to speak again and will find a way to to tell her story, um, even if the committee tomorrow um, shuts that down. You know, whether the RCMP or another police force somehow gets involved or interested in this in this matter of SNC Lavalin. Um, you know, there are some things that this government isn't going to be able con to control. So they're trying to to do as much as they can to take back that narrative. And Marty, we've been talking about sort of what percent precipitated all of this. For those of you watching right now, you're watching a special edition of Power and Politics, and we're waiting for Joyce Murray, the new president of the Treasury Board, to come out following her swearing-in ceremony and address reporters. In the meantime, uh, Marty, Jane Philpott has actually sent out a congratulatory tweet. Uh, she writes just about five minutes ago, congratulations, Joyce Murray, new president of the Treasury Board and minister of digital government. You will be great. Felicitations. <laughs> So kind of it lasts longer than I did. Uh, yeah. <laughs> hashtag. Uh, that was the hashtag, but not actually in the tweet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Look, I mean, uh, th there's a little bit of that's. I think that's the first little bit of solidarity we've seen from Jane Philpott in the last little while. Uh, again, we, we go back to, to what, what we said before. There's going to there's going to be a certain amount of ideological hedging that's going to have to have to happen on the part of, uh, of Miss Murray. Uh, in this file, and look, and, and who's to, who's to know? She probably has it. She's the woman, you know. She served in cabinet and, 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 and with Gord Campbell, you know, conservative-minded liberal uh, in British Columbia on the west coast, uh, and you know, nonetheless came in with with a with a carbon uh, carbon levy system that is, you know, sort of uh, one of the examples that's held out in the world. So it's not to say that she can't get anything done, uh, and I. But I think what what we're going to be looking on. For her to be doing in the next little while is that is practicing exactly that kind of like ability, to, uh, elasticity, uh, and and being uh, open to the idea of the fact that look, uh, our uh, election, re our re-election hopes are tied in uh, in, a, in a great measure to to the TMX pipeline. Uh, and uh, you are here to make sure that that happens. Yeah, I anticipate she'll get a lot of questions on that. Just to recap for our viewers. Joyce Murray, that's who we're waiting for to come out and address uh, reporters. She has been sworn in as the new president of the Treasury Board. Just to give you a bit of background on her, she's been in federal office since 2008. She served under the when the Liberals were in opposition as defense critic for a number of years. Before that, she was a provincial MLA in B.C. She also served as environment minister, I believe, from 2001 to 2005 under former Premier uh, Gordon Campbell. While she's been in government, uh, in this government, she served as the parliamentary secretary to the president of the Treasury Board, so kind of a deputy to the role that she holds now, kind of why a lot of this makes sense and kept this shuffle pretty simple. Uh, she's also introduced a bill, Chris, though, uh, banning crude oil tanker traffic from BC's uh, north coast. So she has been vocal, and we've received throughout the hour a number of questions from viewers who are watching us online about her opposition to pipelines. Uh, and at a time when we expect Cabinet to again, in the next few, well, probably in about three months' time, have to make a decision once more on this pipeline, that could be something that, that, that is interesting for the next election. Well, yes, and now being in cabinet uh, makes it almost impossible for her to do anything but support the party line. And that's certainly, I'm sure, if the prime minister and his people were canvassing her uh, before appointing, well, I'm sure they did canvass her before this, on her views that, that this was one that they would have raised with her. Look, jo Joyce Murray is, in some ways, not a household name, obviously, but someone who is very active on behalf of her constituents. She does lots of studies. She produces reports. Uh, and this issue has been one that has troubled her from the the very beginning. How do you balance the economic activity and the need to get oil from Alberta to a coast uh, versus the environmental degradation that might take place? So she was very much involved in the, uh, the, the review of the Oceans Act, uh, ensuring that this was put in place, that there would be this uh, protection plan. Uh, 
uh, and about the tanker traffic and obviously the impact it could have on the coast. It will be a big issue in the next election campaign. It will be particularly a big issue in Alberta and British Columbia, how they decide to deal with this, how they will, um, who they will point to be the point person on it. Uh, she will clearly be one of those people, along with Jonathan Wilkin, the current uh, fisheries and oceans minister, defending the government's approach on the TMX pipeline, defending the decision to go ahead with it, and, and yeah. certainly now trying to explain to people how they responded to the court decision that required uh, greater protection for the southern resident killer whale, which we already had, and those indigenous consultations, which are ongoing. We expect those decisions on both of those sides that the court had ordered uh, by the end of May. And then, Laura, that keeps this a very live issue because it it goes back to cabinet for another another decision essentially but as Chris had also mentioned Bill C-69 is still very much out there and we've covered a lot of the opposition uh, from the patch let's say from uh, from politicians on the right but there are also an equal number of concerns from the left that it actually doesn't go far enough and 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 doesn't provide the regular the necessary regulatory environment or necessarily stringent enough uh, we see a door opening there so we'll see we'll we'll be awaiting to see if Joyce Murray comes out any moment but, off. yeah that's a, oh, oh I will don't worry <laughs> but but uh, but I just want to get your take on sort of how this is a live issue uh, yeah. very much still and, and that she 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 will find herself in the middle of it yeah I mean this appointment is kind of a nod to the progressive side of of the party or the cabinet right I mean um, Joyce Murray kind of represents um, you know the more left-leaning environmental element I guess you could say of of the liberals so she will bring that perspective to the cabinet table if if Jason Kenney does indeed, as many people believe he will, win um, win the Alberta election, you know she's not a bad person to to have in place to take on the Alberta government. If she says, you know, there was a quid pro quo here of Alberta having a strong climate change uh, policy in order for the pipeline to go through. Go through. You know, yeah. If if Jason Kenney gets rid of that, you know, this is a fight that the that the Liberal government does want to pick with conservative leaning provinces. So in that sense, it, it makes it, it does make sense to put her in that role. Yeah, Marty, what do you think about that? Yeah, uh, you, you said it earlier. Uh, um, conservatives don't think that the, the Bill C-69 goes too far. The, the left thinks it doesn't go far enough. You've hit the sweet spot of exactly what the liberal government has done every, time and time again. And I think Joyce Murray is a very good reflection of that. You mentioned that she was against ta the, was very concerned about tanker traffic in the, on the northern B.C. coast. Lo and behold, the liberal governments came into power in 2015. One of the first things they did was to cancel Northern Gateway for that specific reason. Uh, but this is a classic liberal, big L liberal move: is that you you cancel one and you put all the pressure on the other on the other pipeline. Um, so you know, I was talking earlier about uh, ideological elasticity. This is it in, in, in effect. Um, tanker traffic on the on the west on the north coast of British Columbia is roughly the same as the tanker traffic on the on the south coast. Now, of course, there's population concerns and all that kinds of stuff, but remains that you have to get that oil out of the pipeline uh, away from the coast. Uh, the the issues are identical, so you, it sort of makes you think. Well, if you're against it on the north coast, why aren't you against it in the south coast? Well, well the reason behind that is it's because we're liberals and this is how we get reelected. <laughs> Chris? Well, um, I, I think that we should let that one sink in for just a moment. But uh, there, there is some truth to what, well, there's obviously a lot of truth to what Marty says uh, about how the Liberals do manage uh, uh, competing interests. And it is usually to strike a balance or to attempt to strike a balance between uh, the, the two sides coming up the middle, as you were. Uh, to, to the point about the pipeline, I don't want to overemphasize the importance of it. There are other issues that will obviously be in play in the next election campaign. But if you're looking at British Columbia, uh, the Liberals have, I think, a 17 seats there that's really important that they continue to hold them because they're looking at the potential of you know more competition in the east in Atlantic Canada where they won all the seats unlikely they can repeat their uh, concerns about Ontario with the election of Premier Doug Ford the Conservatives not necessarily a lot of overlap between provincial and federal election campaigns but enough concern being expressed about the Liberal government there and how closely tied the people who were involved with both Kathleen Wynne and Dalton McGinty are who are now so much involved with the, the government here um, so there's a this is a key Key battleground for them. So the, uh, the issues around how well off do Canadians feel, uh, has the government actually done the infrastructure projects that they believe are needed to get people working, and the, the most important question I think right now are the environmental and uh, pipeline related concerns that we've been talking about. Balancing all of those competing interests will be very difficult, and this is what uh, I think Joyce Murray at least represents to them. She is a more progressive member of the Liberal Party. She has been a long-standing uh, voice on uh, the protection of the ocean and the coastline. Um, she will obviously have to play 
play a prominent role. And Chris, also the the interplay between the NDP and the Liberals out in BC. Yeah, uh, and also we've, we've interesting. yeah we've seen today, for example, the Liberals naming a candidate in Nanaimo. Uh, Nanaimo Ladysmith. Smith. Smith. for the com upcoming federal by-election, we weren't convinced that there was going to yeah. be one, given how close the the federal election is. Uh, when Jagmeet Singh just won his seat uh, in an area, uh, Burnaby South isn't directly on the path, but it's certainly next door to where the terminus is of the Trans Mountain Pipeline and where the oil tankers are. The seat to the north, Burnaby North Seymour, is held by Terry Beach, who's a liberal. Uh, the NDP is certainly not out of play there. They believe they have an opportunity as well to try to pick up some seats in that area in the lower mainland. And although uh, although we have seen a number of uh, sort of prominent NDP MPs, including um, uh, Nathan Cullen, Laura, step away in, in BC, you can imagine that province will be, I mean... And we shouldn't forget the Greens, too. Yeah, the Greens, no, yeah, the, of course, definitely, the Greens. I mean, that is... The, never forget the Greens. Yeah, it should never forget the Greens, <laughs> words to live by. But those are these are some pretty important issues uh, that, that Joyce Murray will have sort of added prominence on, given her new position in Cabinet. Yes, and I think that, that her progressive background, you know, being a stalwart defender of environmental policies, you know, being on the record um, um, of opposing buying the Trans Mountain Pipeline, you know, could work in her favor for electoral prospects um, in the province. I mean, the NDP is likely going to be competitive in British Columbia. The Green Party, we can't discount them. They do seem like they're on the rise in certain parts of the country. Um, so that, you know, that progressive vote is is going to be at play. So to have someone like Joyce Murray in a very high profile position, um, such as Treasury Board, could help the Liberal prospects in British Columbia in the next election. Um, don't forget, forget, Chris, you mentioned, you know, where the Liberals might lose seats. I think Alberta um, is certainly a place where they're where um, you the know, few that they have there might the, be they gone. have they have th you know and it can and three can make a difference mm -hmm. um, in a, in a tight election so uh, yeah. I certainly yeah. think they they want to pick up seats in other parts of the country. If you're just joining us now, you're watching a special edition, Monday morning edition of Power and Politics. We just saw the swearing-in ceremony for Joyce Murray, a very simple one-person cabinet shuffle to replace Jane Philpott, the outgoing uh, president of the Treasury Board who quit cabinet in the middle of the SNC-Lavalin controversy back on March 4th. We're standing by for Joyce Murray any minute now to come out and address reporters. Any yeah, any minute, I swear, I promise <laughs> you. Uh, any minute. But we have been, we also uh, have been joined by viewers on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and you've been sending us questions and I want to ask one because I think it's a pretty interesting one and I'm, I'm guessing one that a lot of Canadians will have heading into the election. Tim Cameron on Facebook asks, is the culture of politics on both sides of the spectrum so corrupt, cutthroat and isolated from reality that we can uh, never expect people with honesty and integrity to seek office? That's kind of interesting in light, Marty, of, I mean, it's, a, it's heavy, yes. but, but in light of, uh, of everything that's being discussed about integrity throughout this SNC-Lavalin controversy, yeah. integrity and confidence and uh, the way in which people conduct themselves, like Chris said, has said, there's n that line of legality, uh, it appears, has not been crossed. We've heard from Jody Wilson-Raybould that she doesn't believe it was crossed, but there are a lot of questions around ethics and doing what's right and what, what is or what isn't appropriate. Do you think that, um, what do you think about this question? Well, I think it's a, I think it's a very good question. Uh, I have my own answers. It's part of the reason I'll never get into politics, but <laughs> uh, unless I'm writing about it. But uh, I, I think I think one of the good things about all this is I think part of the reason the liberals are suffering so much from this is because they came from such a high point. Uh, you know, you go back to 2015, talking about openness and integrity and sunny ways, and we're gonna we're gonna do things differently than the last government. Uh, lo, lo and behold, and, and for for. You know, for all intents and purposes, that how did the liberals deal with their first? What was essentially their first big, big scandal? They acted exactly as as the other parties would. Uh, that is the, the other party, I guess, the Conservative Party. That is to say, use your majority as a cudgel to basically cut off dissent, to to sort of starve the scandal of oxygen, uh, uh, and uh, and to batten down the hatches and behave exactly as a cynical party uh, does when they're under attack. That is to say, uh, basically shut down completely. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's part of one of the main reasons why, why the Liberals are suffering so much. If the Liberals had come into power not on that sort of idea that they were going to be they were going to be doing politics differently, I don't think they'd be suffering nearly as much. In other words, if it was a Conservative Party coming in uh, at this point, basically saying we're going to toe the line, we're going to do things uh, as we did before, I don't think you would have. They would have been suffering nearly as much. But given the fact that that Trudeau 
uh, was so big on making a market departure from the from the previous government and then turns around and acts basically exactly as it as the previous government would in the situation has hurt him a fair bit. It's interesting, Chris. Yeah, sorry. I was just say just to Tim's question. Um, I think most people, the vast majority, get into politics for all the right reasons. They believe in public service. They want to represent their constituents. There are issues they don't think are being adequately explored and dealt with at the federal level or at any level. Um, but to Marty's point, we've we've talked at length over the years about the power that centralized in the prime minister's office. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that's healthy for for the parliamentary system. It makes it difficult for MPs to actually do the work that they are sent to do to be heard. And that's why caucus has become uh, such a vocal place, and why we get so many leaks out of caucus is that people don't feel that their their interests are being uh, satisfied and they're worried about their own futures. Uh, Jean Chrétien once famously said, "The thing you liked best about politics was winning elections, because if you win elections, you get to <laughs> you get to exercise power." Um, so that's that's the fundamental name of the game here. You want to win, and once you're in power, the the focus is on holding power, and you try to do that. If you're if you if you were Justin Trudeau, you try to do it in a more transparent and accountable way than your predecessor. But it turns out once you're in office, sometimes it's not as easy to do yeah, as you think it is, and as a result, he's found himself in this space. I, I agree with Marty that uh, one of the reasons the liberals are I think are having so much trouble with it is because they promised to be so very different from the preceding government uh, that they were going to be more open and transparent. Parent, in the end, it hasn't actually worked out to be that way. And I think, Laura, especially where Jody Wilson-Raybould and the SNC-Lavalin controversy is concerned, some I think the government would argue, wait, we have we have done things a bit differently. We let her appear before the Justice Committee. We have uh, we heard from her extensively. Well, Joe, we heard from Jerry Butts extensively. But then we've got, for example, tomorrow uh, a debate happening behind closed doors with that committee about hearing from her for a second time. She has said she has more to say and that she's willing to do so. But so far, liberal members on that committee have have basically expressed zero desire to see that happen. Yeah, I mean, they've heard from her to a point to what is re what they what they presume is reasonable to hear from um, a cabinet minister who has resigned. Um, but it is clear that the liberal members of that committee don't want her to come back. Um, you know, they, they believe she's presented her side of the story. Um, and Gerald Butts, the, the former principal secretary for Prime Minister Trudeau, has presented his. And now they believe it's up to, to the public to judge. Um, you know, but we have seen them bow to pressure as well. There kind of doesn't ha seem to have been a clear strategy um, on the part of the Liberals from the get-go on this matter. So, you know, depending on the outcry, I guess it is possible that um, Jody Wilson-Raybould could come back, but all signs point to um, this isn't going to happen. Uh, I mean, one interesting thing on, on, the, on the viewer's question is, you know, the cynicism that has been brought forward as a result of this um, SNC-Lavalin affair. I mean, one thing that, the, that Justin Trudeau promised in the last election to combat that, that was electoral reform. And that was a big part oh, of that. Joyce... Of, Joyce exactly. Murray, like, wanted that. Joyce too. Murray oh. really championed that in her liberal leadership yeah. bid. Um, and that was, of course, abandoned, um, one of the many broken promises <laughs> um, from, from, this, um, from this liberal government. But that was supposed to contribute to the, you know, the, the decentralization of power in the prime minister's office, for instance, that more voices were supposed to be heard. Um, and, um, and that clearly has not happened. And that's just an interesting Joyce Murray element you know, mm -hmm. when we talk about the fact that she is on the progressive side of the spectrum of, uh, of this government. Yeah, that's an interesting point, Marty. I mean, as we wait for Joyce Murray, uh, we thought any moment, hopefully still any moment, to come out to, to talk to reporters. But her position, not only on the pipeline, which we've been discussing extensively on the TMX pipeline, but also on electoral reform, which, as Laura mentions, was a big promise, one that resonated with a lot of progressive Canadians, though ultimately in B.C., for example, when it provincially came down to a vote, it didn't go ahead. Uh, you know, she, she, that, that is a very clear uh, broken promise, not one that you can, you can make many arguments about. Absolutely. But again, you know, I talked a bit about uh, how liberals run run elections and that kind of thing. They're very clear minded and pragmatic. Uh, I was standing 50 feet away from Trudeau uh, the night of the uh, the night when he won in 2015. And one of the one of the first things that came out of his mouth was that, that this is going to be the last last election where we have uh, first past the post. Um, they suddenly they very, very quickly realized that, you know, uh, not only is that feasible, it doesn't really make sense. We just won with first past the post. Why should we destroy it? Uh, that that first thing. But the other thing too is that it wasn't really that much of a of a of a political issue. Uh, look how look how the referendum went in, on the West Coast in British Columbia. You know, people people are people like the status quo because they're scared of change. 
Uh, and I think that's what that's something that the, that the Liberal government took to heart and just decided to break that promise because they realize they're not going to suffer very much from that broken promise. Okay, as I mentioned, if you're just joining us now, we are, uh, this is a special edition of Power in Politics, and we're waiting for Joyce Murray, the new president of the Treasury Board, to come out and talk to reporters. If you're also watching us on Facebook and Twitter and uh, YouTube, keep your comments coming in, your questions coming in. We appreciate them. I'm going to go to another one. Uh, Chris, Ellie Gordon asks on Facebook about this this pick, about Joyce Murray as a pick. How much do you think gender played into it? Uh, and then she's asking if cabinet is still gender balanced. And yes, cabinet remains gender balanced. And I think that was one of the important criteria. It may not have been the most important one now, but uh, certainly it was a factor. I think it was more important that she came from British Columbia and more important that she had a more than a passing familiarity with the Treasury Board uh, function, which is not necessarily one that most Canadians understand, but is absolutely vital to making sure that money flows for government priorities in an orderly fashion that it's spent uh, in a transparent and accountable way. So uh, I think that was probably a more important factor than the fact that she's a woman. Laura, there's still a lot of questions uh, about, uh, I guess, the, the Prime Minister's feminist credentials, or at least among uh, among uh, those who are critical of of what happened with, with Jody Wilson-Raybould and Jane Philpott, especially because both were very uh, prominent female members of Cabinet. The, the government has fought back against those uh, characterizations and, and, and uh, done so quite uh, ardently over the past few weeks. But uh, do you think there, I mean, d did it kind of have to be a woman today? Um, you know, I think it did. I think I think it was very important for for the prime minister to to maintain gender parity in the cabinet. I think that's you know that's one of the key things that that observe political watchers and and pundits and everything would would look towards. And that and because the liberal government made, made such a big deal out of it um, when they came into office, and it's it's been such a key message of of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's over the past four years. Um, that that they need to maintain it, but I think as Chris mentioned, I mean it's it, it all worked out well because Joyce Murray has all, is already familiar with the file because she served as the parliamentary secretary for the past okay. um, three and, and a half and years. Here, and here she is, Joyce Murray taking questions from reporters. Let's listen in. Good morning, uh, Minister. Si pour vous de en français, if you en could anglais, answer in French and English uh, for uh, my colleagues, part, I'd like to know, first of all, because there's a caucus meeting on Wednesday, Madame and the question Wilson is whether Ms. Uh, Wilson-Raybould and Ms. Philpott should remain in caucus. What is your view on this, and what should happen on Wednesday at that meeting? Well, I believe that it's uh, great that they want to remain in our Liberal caucus with our leader, the Prime Minister, and I'm looking forward to welcoming them, welcoming them, in, welcoming, welcoming them to our caucus meeting. They're part of our team, and I hope that will continue to be the case. Uh, I'm looking forward to Madame Philpot and uh, Madame Wilson-Raybould being part of our team as we continue forward, and I'm very happy that that's what they would like to be doing, is being part of the, the Liberal Caucus, uh, working with the, our Prime Minister to, uh, create a, to create a better country, uh, to create benefits for Canadians. Vous avez eu un désaccord avec euh, le Premier ministre sur l'achat. You had a disagreement with the Prime Minister with respect to the purchase of the Trans Mountain pipeline. Has your position changed since, and will this affect your relationship with the Prime Minister around the cabinet table? I apologize, but first of all, I would like to say that I want to extend my sympathies to the victims and the families in New Zealand. As a result of the recent tragedy uh, over the weekend, and I want to say that my thoughts go out to the families and friends of the victims, and of course uh, to the Muslim community here in Canada and around the world. Express my deep condolences for the families and friends of the victims of the recent massacre in New Zealand and to say that uh, my heart goes out to them and I'm holding also in my heart the Muslim community 
in Canada and around the world that are deeply affected by this kind of terrible tragedy. Uh, in terms of the, so your question about the pipeline, well, my job as a member of parliament actually is to represent my community, and I did that on the issue of the Trans Mountain pipeline expansion. And it's the job of the cabinet and the prime minister to make a decision that is in the interest of all Canadians, and that's what they did. And I will never accept the idea that that pipeline is negative for climate change because, in fact, it brought Alberta into the pan-Canadian framework, taking significant action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions so that we can meet our objectives as a country. So the, uh, the Federal Court of Appeal um, pointed out two areas that needed to be worked on, and those were areas that I had concern about. And the government is addressing those areas, the marine environment, and consultation with Indigenous people so that this project can go forward in the right way. Katie Simpson, CBC News. Um, it's, Parliament's been away for a couple of weeks, and it, it's no secret that it's been a difficult couple of weeks, but more importantly, a difficult couple of months for the Liberals. What, from your perspective, needs to be done to rebuild unity from within? It has been, it has been a challenging few weeks. And the, Premier, the Prime Minister has acknowledged that he could do better and we could do better as a team in terms of good communications, that there was a communication breakdown. And there, he has made a commitment and we all have made a commitment to be aware of that and seek ways to improve communications. And that's what we plan to do because we are all very united uh, in the important work that is being done in reducing poverty, in tackling climate change, in uh, creating, creating a, a, uh, an economy in which Canadians can create jobs. And uh, we all want to work together to further that uh, agenda uh, over the coming months until the October election. And as far as you're concerned, do you have more questions for Jody Wilson-Raybould as well as for the Prime Minister's office as to what happened with the SNC-Lavalin affair? No, I don't. I am pleased that, uh, that the former Attorney General is interested in remaining part of the team, and uh, I hope that that will be the outcome. Good morning, Minister. It's Annie with CTV National News. You are the third Treasury Board President in less than three months. I'm wondering what your priorities will be moving forward and how you intend to rebuild the confidence of Canadians who may feel that the importance of this portfolio has been pushed aside given recent uh, resignations. Well, I'm looking forward to uh, tackling the very busy agenda of this, uh, of this ministry, Treasury Board and Digital Government. The work has been continuing. There's key things that are moving forward, like uh, engaging in collective bargaining with public uh, sector unions uh, so that, uh, uh, that they can be, uh, they can have their needs met. And uh, the, uh, a new approach to the Phoenix pay system so that we can move forward and, uh, and address the, uh, the difficulties that the pay system has created, uh, sadly, for so many public servants. So there's a lot to do, and I am going to be focused on the agenda, continuing and completing the agenda that has been set out and building on the really good work of previous uh, Treasury Board Presidents. Abigail Beeman, Global News. Uh, Minister, your new job became available because someone left who didn't have confidence in the government's handling of a file. I'm wondering how you feel about the circumstances that brought you to this new job. Well, the past few weeks have been difficult, and I have expressed my confidence in our Prime Minister and my support for the work that we are doing on behalf of Canadians. And that, that and I'm, I'm very honoured to be asked to uh, lead the Treasury Board and digital government so we can continue with that work. As a follow-up, uh, you, you said you had no more questions about the SNC-Lavalin case. I, I just want to clarify there, there's no one else you think we need to hear from? There's no lingering questions in your mind about how this was handled? I think the Prime Minister has been clear that this was not 
uh, that there was a failure of communication and that he will be leading our team and looking at how we can do better. And so uh, I think that that's what we will be doing as a, as a caucus and potentially as a cabinet. And I've got all confidence in the Prime Minister to lead that, uh, to, to lead that initiative and to put, to move uh, towards the completing the work that is underway on behalf of Canadians. Last question. Martin Stringer from CPAC. I just want to ask you on a personal level, um, by all descriptions, three weeks ago the Prime Minister was telling you to take all the time you needed off because of the accident with your son in Mexico. Uh, you and your husband went down to medevac and back to Canada. Can, any reflections on how the kind of, I don't know, the kind of twists and turns that life takes? Well, that was uh, the, we got a, the phone call that no parent wants to have. Uh, we, as you said, went to Mexico to assist in bringing Eric back to Canada. And I'm happy to say that uh, he is healing well. He's in great uh, spirits. He's still in Vancouver General Hospital, but we hope that he will be home soon uh, for uh, for uh, convalescence and eventually rehabilitation of his injuries. And, you know, I really appreciated the outpouring of support uh, that, uh, that I received and experienced from not just family and friends, but the broader network, Canadians. It was very, uh, it was, it really felt like a community uh, it felt like the support of the community was there, and that was that was extremely important at that difficult time. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. And that was newly sworn in President of the Treasury Board, Joyce Murray, taking questions from reporters just a few minutes ago, or about 20 minutes ago. She was sworn into Cabinet to replace Jane Philpott, the outgoing President of the Treasury Board, who quit Cabinet amid the controversy surrounding SNC-Lavalin. Al allegations there from the former Attorney General, Jody Wilson-Raybould, that she was inappropriately pressured by people in the Prime Minister's office and others in government to intervene in the SNC-Lavalin criminal case. That is what has brought us to this point. The third cabinet shuffle for the Trudeau government in as many months. Uh, Chris, some interesting things uh, out of that press yep. conference I would highlight. First, a caucus talking about the presence of Jody Wilson-Raybould and Jane Philpott still as liberals saying that she welcomes them and that she's uh, happy that they still want to be members of the, quote, members of the team. She also acknowledged the questions around her stance on pipelines and made the argument that you had highlighted that she would probably make, which is that uh, she doesn't think it'll have a negative effect on climate change because it brought Alberta into the liberal climate plan, essentially. Yeah, so she was uh, obviously prepared for that question, and it is a critical one, given an election campaign that uh, the Trans Mountain Pipeline uh, is hugely divisive still in British Columbia, and uh, she is state that I had to represent my constituents, and that's why I spoke out about the importance of better protection for the ocean, and I spoke out in favor against the, the purchase of the pipeline, uh, but Cabinet made an a decision in the, in the national interest, which she now supports. So uh, clearly she is on board with this, and clearly, as we have been saying, waiting for her to come out to speak, it will be an issue she will have to address many times in the weeks and days ahead. Laura, she also uh, was asked about whether or not she has any questions around the SNC-Lavalin affair, whether she has more questions for Jody Wilson-Raybould. I think she was asked that by Katie Simpson first. Uh, obviously an important question given that there's going to be a debate tomorrow over whether or not to recall Jody Wilson-Raybould before the Justice Committee, which is looking into this matter. She said, you know, she kept saying it's been a challenging few weeks, but that she doesn't have any lingering questions. Yeah, and I think that's a sign of things to come um, for tomorrow's yeah. meeting. I mean, if the message from the uh, new Treasury Board president is, you know, we need to improve our communications, I have confidence, confidence in the Prime Minister, and I don't have any other questions about what Jody Wilson-Raybould has to say, I think that's, um, that's a pretty striking message to the members of the committee. I mean, the message that I heard from Joyce Murray during this uh, short press conference was just, team ahead of self, right? I mean, she talked about the the importance of, of the Liberal policies on climate change and, and poverty reduction. She wants uh, Jody Wilson-Raybould and Jane Philpott to remain in caucus, but I think her message to them there is put the policies, put the Liberal team ahead of yourself. And I think that's going to be key for her in this file. What stood out for you, Marty, in that press conference? 
Uh, just that she said that she would welcome uh, Jody Wilson Raybould. She said it more or less unprompted, which was interesting. Uh, that she wanted Jody Wilson Raybould to remain in in caucus. Uh, pressure's on for for the uh, for the Trudeau government when, as far as that's concerned, because having her stay on, I mean, there are pluses and minuses to either side. I would argue that it would probably be best if she weren't around, but obviously they might see differently. Yeah, Chris, it's interesting. Uh, she used that. I thought that word welcoming was interesting. Part of the team sort of uh, almost laying the groundwork for how the Liberals are going to frame their continued presence, Jody Wilson-Raybould and Jane Philpott's continued presence in right. Cabinet. Right. She, th this is a team, and they are still members of the team, despite having expressed a lack of confidence in the Prime Minister in the handling of the SNC-Lavalin affair. The idea, I, I think, that the Canadian want Canadians to get is that SNC-Lavalin is now behind us. We are now focused on the future, which has an election campaign coming, uh, and that they are important contributors to that team. Uh, also, along with Marty, struck by the fact that she did offer that, uh, that sort of view uh, unprompted and put this aside as just simply a communications problem. Mm -hmm. Clearly, it has been more than that, but that's what Gerald Butts told the committee. That's how the Prime Minister has framed the, the problems up until now. So the communications, no problem here. We're all on the same page. It's about we're ready to move ahead. SNC-Lavalin is behind us. Yeah, it'll be very interesting to see it. It's kind of a signal of what we can expect, yeah. I think, around messaging Absolutely. around this. All right. Well, I want to thank all three of you so much for sticking around for this nearly two-hour uh, one-person cabinet shuffle. I really appreciate your time. Yeah, special edition of the time Monday flies. Power Panel. It sure does. Thanks to all three of you. Thanks to Laura Stone, Marty Patrick, and Chris Hall, and also to Janice McGregor, who was bringing us those updates from the very cold uh, scene outside of Rideau Hall. Of course, Power and Politics will be back at 5 o'clock Eastern this evening uh, with all the latest on this cabinet shuffle and what ensues over the day. We've got, of course, question period back after a two-week break with MPs and their constituencies and the debut of just Jagmeet Singh, the NDP's leader in question period in the House. Thanks for joining us on CBC News Network. And online, we're going to hand things back now to Heather Hiscox in Toronto.